Praise the Lord, everybody. This is the day that the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Thank you for joining me today with Coffee Time with Apostle Lee. And you know what? We are talking about something that I think the church needs to get a hold of and needs to get a handle of. And I'm just going to go ahead and pre-warn you, okay, that this is probably going to step on some toes. This is probably going to make a few people feel uncomfortable, but I am persuaded today that it's also going to unlock some people's heart that have held on to hatred and bitterness because they were unable to let go and unable to forgive a thing because the people have been trying to push the wrong definition of forgiveness on their situation and on their matter. So this is an uncon un unconventional talk today. This is an unconventional word about, un uh, about forgiveness. Now, I am all for forgiveness. I think the Lord said to me today, as he ministered to me, and don't take this as, as arrogance. Don't take this as arrogance. But the Lord began to minister to me today. And he said to me specifically that you are one of the most forgiving people that I know. I said, wow, that was really big. I began to think over my life, all of the hardships that I have been through, that other people caused, that other people inflicted upon my life. Because I've always been a quiet kind of person that is, I'm loud, but I've also always been an introvert. I can, I, I've never really experienced a lot of loneliness because I've always been a person who enjoyed being alone and enjoyed my quiet time and things like that. I love my friends. I love when I can socialize, but too much socialization, whoo, it's like it drains the battery out of my pack. So I have to have that time of rest and recovery in order to, you know, get my energy back. So I thought about my life. I thought about all the different things that I went through in my life, all of the things that people have done to me that have not been so kind and have not been so godly. And no matter how much I tried to stay angry or tried to stay mad, I found out that I'm just not the type of person that can hold a grudge. I just, it's just, <laughs> it's just not in me. It is what it is and it ain't what it ain't. And it's absolutely okay. You know, I have uh, service people in my salon and been there for women who have committed all kind of atrocities against me. I have had people who have tried to slander my name and then they wind up homeless and ask me of all people for a place to live. And good God Almighty, I'm not saying I would do it again today, but I did put a roof over their head. Um, I have had um, different I mean, I, the list goes on and on. You wouldn't even believe, okay, all of the challenges that I've had to face in my life, sometimes by the people who were absolutely close to me. I mean, blood. Uh, sometimes I've been betrayed by my absolute blood. And I, now I'm not going to sit there and tell anybody that um, there is no recompense for what the people have done, that they don't need to make any adjustments or... Um, uh, they don't need to repent for, they don't need to pay any restitution for what they have done. But I got a way of living and let live. You know, that we're gonna forget it and we're gonna move on. You know, if you try to do a little better, we can we can put it on the bridge and, and move on. But I want to talk to you today about the three different levels of forgiveness. Because oftentimes we try to back people in a corner with this thing called forgiveness that is not God and that is not a godly attribute or even a godly requirement when it comes to forgiveness. Because on the most people who even claim that they are quoting the word of God, if they put God on trial for forgiveness according to their definition then God would be an unforgiving God. The fact that Satan has been sentenced to hell, my God, according to the fact that the Lord did not excuse Satan from his punishment. Ooh, 
Even though God ain't holding no grudges. He too big. He too full of love. He too full of joy. He too full of peace. He too full of faith. You know, in the presence of the Lord, there is the fullness of joy. But because God is a just God, then he handles things in a just way and in a just manner. Satan can't come back in heaven and rule and reign. Satan can't come back in heaven and gain his same position back. Satan can't come back in heaven. Can you imagine being in Satan's shoes to be able to be where God is, but yet not be able to be sensitive to the presence of God? Because the presence of God will bring about repentance. My God today, the presence of God will make you say, I'm sorry for something that you found pleasure in and you thought was okay, but when you get in the presence of God, he begins to convict your heart and let you know that the thing that you have been doing is not pleasing in his sight. The thing that you have found yourself finding pleasure in is not bringing pleasure to God, and all of a sudden, even though you may have been doing that thing for years, you may have been in fornication for years and never thought twice about it. You may have been cussing all your life and never thought twice about it, but when you get in the presence of of Almighty God, because of his love that washes over you, it makes you, and because you love him so much, you want to please him, so it makes your heart cry out, God, I didn't realize the depth of my wrong, God, I am sorry. I am sorry. When we look at the story of Judas, when we look at the story of Judas and we consider that Judas killed himself because of the guilt that he felt, that he felt after he betrayed Jesus, but Jesus had already forgiven him. Judas didn't have to die, y'all. <laughs> he didn't have to die. If he would have went back to the right source, if he would have went back to Jesus instead of going back to the uh, leaders that he sold Jesus out to and they paid him 30 pieces of silver to betray Jesus to tell his information to give him up in the garden <laughs> they paid him 30 pieces of silver but when they realized that when Judas realized that Jesus wasn't going to fight back and that his kingdom was made of a totally different thing and that they were actually going to take him, nail him to the cross and crucify him. The Bible declares that Judas wept sorely and that he repented in his heart, took the money back to the leaders that had bribed him and paid him and told them to take the money back. But they would not take the blood money back. Come on, somebody. They wouldn't take the money back. And because they wouldn't take the money back, Judas felt like he could not walk into a place of forgiveness. Instead of taking the money back to the people, you know what? He should have went to Jesus and said, I'm sorry. He should have went to Jesus and tried to make it right. Come on. He should have went to Jesus because Jesus probably would have told him to take that money and give it to the poor. Okay. Jesus probably would have told him the thing that you've used to bring evil to the house of God. Now take that thing and do good with it. That's what I love about the Lord. But because, because Judas did not go to the right source, I'm preaching good. So you might not catch nothing I'm saying right now, but 2 o'clock in the morning, it's going to hit you. My God, that's what Apostle Lee was talking about. He went back to the right, if he would have went back to the right source, Judas would have still been an apostle. Come on. Oh, my God, if he would have went back to the right source and got his heart right, come on and went back to Jesus, he would have found out that Jesus wasn't even mad because he had to go that way. Come on, that no man took his life, but he laid his life down. Okay, so we're talking about, let's get into the lesson. Let's get into the three different levels of forgiveness because we've been misquoting it wrong. We've been counseling people wrong. And if, if the, the same level of forgiveness might not be needed for someone who stole a 35 cent pack of gum from the store. The same level of forgiveness might not be needed for the person who stole that gum as it is for the person who may have took somebody's spouse. The same level of forgiveness might not be needed for somebody who took somebody's spouse as somebody who uh, kidnapped somebody's kids and put them in a car and burnt them alive. There's a different level. Woo! I'm preaching good. There's a different level of forgiveness for each 
situation. But we don't want to hear that because the devil and the world, come on somebody, has, has counseled the church for so long that we've actually taken on the mindset of the world. That everything is the same when in the kingdom of God nothing is the same. Because we operate in the spirit of wisdom and wisdom is the ability to recognize the difference. That's why the devil was able to defeat and deceive Eve. It's because she couldn't recognize the difference. The words sounded the same. Oh my God. It sounded just like the words that God had told her. He mimicked the spirit of the Lord, but his spirit was a spirit of deception. His spirit was not a spirit of truth. So he used the same words, but he twisted them in a different way. And she was not able because she thought, okay, he said word for word. He said exactly what God said. He got to be telling me the truth. But how many know people can use the word of God and twist it in a way that don't bring God any glory? They can twist it in a way that God is not pleased with. So that's why she wound up being deceived because she could not recognize difference. I do have a lot of mercy for Eve. Though. I had a lot of mercy for Eve because Eve didn't have the filter of pain. Eve didn't have the filter of rejection. Eve didn't have the filter of mistrust. Eve didn't have the filter of betrayal because she never been betrayed before. She's never been lied to before. Come on. This is the first time betrayal has entered in the life of a human being. She didn't know. She didn't have no point of reference. She would have never imagined in a thousand years that somebody was lying to her and somebody was deceiving her because surely God has never done it. Surely her husband had never done it. She was living in, in the garden. She was living in a place of ease. She was living in a place where there was no toil and there was no confusion and there was no strife and there was no bickering and there were no tears of sadness. She was living in a place of peace. And the Bible says that deceivers, just like their father Satan, they're always spying out and looking for the quiet in the land. Oh, my God. Psalms say they look out for the quiet in the land. You know. So my heart goes out for Eve because she had no point of reference. Of, and sometimes we go into situations so innocently and so vulnerable. We have no expectation that uh, the hurt that we're about to be engaged with is going to be inflicted upon us. And so sometimes after we went through certain situations and trials, we come out changed. We come out changed, but people of God, we have to be careful that we don't come out damaged. Come on, that we don't come out in a place of irrepair, but we allow that thing to make us stronger. Yes, when you go through a season where you feel broken? Yes. Will you go through a season where you feel like you need to be mended? Absolutely. Yes. But we thank God that God is the balm of Gilead. So he takes us even in our broken places, even in our wounded places, he takes and he mends us. When they were traveling, the stranger was traveling on the, on the road to Samaria and it was a man that had been beaten there. <laughs> And the good Samaritan stopped and binded up his wounds. And the Bible say poured oil in his wounds. And then he went and put him in the inn and made sure that he had care. And he said, if I owe you anything else, when I come back, I'll pay for it. I'll cover the bill. He had to be wound. He had to be healed. His wounds had to be cared for. But we can't sit in a place with open wounds, people of God. And that's what I'm mighty afraid of. I'm afraid that even as the people of God, that we're sitting with all of these open wounds because we believe it either got to be uh, God, Jesus got to step up and totally erase every scar from that wound, or we either got to deal with it so that we can remember not to go that way no more. But can I tell you, God can totally heal you from a thing, but there still might be a little uh, place left there that you can tell where the incision was made, that you can tell where the cut was made, but when you can press it and there's no more pain, glory to God, when it can be touched. 
and you ain't saying ouch no more. Come on. When it can be pulled on. Hey, my God. And you're not crying anymore. You know that healing has taken place. Come on, somebody. My scars don't mean I'm broken. Come on. My scars mean I've been mended. Hallelujah. My scars mean I've been repaired. My, my scars tell the story of my recovery. My scars tell the story of my testimony that gives God the glory because that's how I choose to give it to him. Through the good and the bad, the ups and the downs, I give God the glory for all things. I think 1 Thessalonians 5 and 18 says it like this. In all things give thanks, for this is the will of God concerning you. That we give God praise for everything. We can stand like Joseph did in Genesis 15 and 20 and say, Though you meant evil against me, my God has worked it for my good. And not just worked it for my good so I could come out and say, I came out. But he worked it for my good that I might save much people alive. That what you've been through, what you've uh, been faced with, that it was bigger than you. And it was so that other people could find their freedom. Come on. That you could be a, a Harriet Tubman in the spirit, leading people to the way of freedom. Leading people uh, on their way out because now you know the way. Come on. Now you know the way. Now you know how to turn that place. Now you know how to cry out to God Because you cried out to God for days and days When you were in your pain Saying God take me from here Come on you prayed and you asked God Plenty of days God do I have to go through this All over again You prayed plenty of days and said God I just don't want to deal with the trauma And the drama Can you take me on to glory now Can you take me on to heaven now No I'm not suicidal But I do not want to be here And sometimes if we really be honest some of us have been slapped suicidal like my God I wish I could just drive on off of the bridge like somebody come too close to your car and you like baby just go ahead and answer my prayer because I wish you would hit me today you know we've been in that place but thanks be to God that God don't hear all of that foolishness and he works things out for our good that he's always perfecting us he's always building us and he's always causing us to triumph. He's causing us. He's always pushing us in the right direction. I thank God that God didn't answer some of them crazy prayers. God, take me out. I'm glad God let me live on and see what the end gonna be. I'm glad God gave me one more day. The song say one more day. <laughs> I know y'all get tired of me saying it on you. One more day. Y'all have forgot the rest of it. But anyway, you gave me one more day. Say I was thinking the other day about the joy that came my way. All oh, the things that had me down. The things that had me bound. But now I stand around, looking around in the days, because I stand before you with nothing but praise. Oh, Lord, oh, Lord, we pray, praise you. Did it go to one more day? One more day? Yeah, we thank God for giving us one more day. For one more day. So anyway... I done said for about three times that I was going to get into these levels of forgiveness, right? So let's go ahead and hit them. Let's go ahead and hit the levels of forgiveness, and I'm going to try to work through them. I think I'm going to try to work through them real quickly. The three levels are release, forbearance, and exoneration. Release, forbearance, and exoneration. I'm teaching on this today so that when you counsel people, when you deal with issues yourself and you know that you have fully released something from your heart and that you have forgiven a person, but the enemy will try to come back to you with uh, that, that, that manipulative magic and all of that stuff, try to cast spells on your mind and be with your mind and make you think, but well, I must not be forgiving them because... I can't go out to dinner with them. I must not be to forgive them because, you know, I can't let them come in my house. I mean, I don't know a person in their right mind that would let the family pervert keep their children. You know your uncle got a problem. <laughs> I don't think nobody in their right mind, they might love the uncle to death. When they Thanksgiving come, I'll bring you a plate. <laughs> okay, when I make your favorite cake, you are welcome to some. I love you two pieces, but you can't babysit my kids. Matter of fact, don't even come in the room when my kids are in there, okay, by themselves. You put a guard around 
um, the thing that you've been set to love, protect, and honor. Even though you may love that person, but there has to be a boundary that has to be established and set in place. So the first level, the lowest level of forgiveness, the first level is what we call release. It's what we call release. And this is biblical, biblically based, y'all biblically based and i realize that most people don't go into this level or depth of study because they've never had to they've never been faced with situations that make them search out the word like this because they've never had to forgive on this level that most of us thank god that most of us haven't had our children burnt alive or haven't been raped or beaten and left for dead and haven't been carjacked at gunpoint that somebody might have stole your car but they didn't beat you down with a gun i had a young lady uh when i had my salon that came to get her hair done and she said one night she had a flat tire she pulled on the side of the road and she said some people had stopped and asked her if she needed any help. She was like, no, that's okay. I'll get it worked out. She said, this next guy, he stopped. And he said, ma'am, you need some help. He was so kind and wonderful. She said he was a very nice-looking white man and things of that sort. She said she really looked at him like, okay, he looks very trustworthy. I'll let him help me. She said, he, she said yes, I have a flat tire. And he said, well, okay, great. Just if you got a spare or whatever, another tire in the trunk. Just get it out. She said, okay, great. She said she got out of her car, got to the trunk. She said, next thing you know, she woke up four months later. She woke up four months later, still in the hospital, still battered and bruised and pregnant. She had that baby. Beautiful, beautiful girl. She's in her 20s now. She had that baby. She didn't raise the child, but she kept the child very close near her you know she let people that she knew help to raise that baby and raise that child so thank god that most of us hadn't haven't had to go through things like that so we would never probably study forgiveness on that level but you got to, you got to get before god working on some forgiveness on that level so most of us when we talk about forgiveness we think about the people who lied on us Somebody who spread a, a, spread a rumor on us. So we never, thank God, we can't relate to all the different levels of forgiveness. But I'm just going to educate the church today so that we're not misappropriating things and leaving people in trauma because of our cute little cupcake definitions of things that we have not experienced, okay? So the first one is release. <laughs> release simply means... No, you know what? I'm not, I'm gonna I'm gonna finish with release. I'm gonna finish with release. Okay, I'm gonna finish with release because I'm gonna start with the one that's most familiar to us and the one that we think about the most when we hear the word forgiveness. Because when we are Christians, we think like God, but we also have to remember, ain't nobody God but God. Even though we do take on the attributes of God and God will allow us to forgive at the same level that He forgives on. But you got to remember that even with God, everybody don't receive the exact same treatment. Okay, there's a term in the Bible that called meat, M-E-T-E. -E. It means measurement. And it even talks about, you know, when we forgive and when we judge, we'll be measured back with the same measure that we do it. So that lets you know right there that everybody don't have the same measurement because it's going to be given back in the same direction. Uh, that we measure in. So anyway, the first one is called exoneration. Exoneration. That's what we think about when most people think about the word forgiveness. And exonerate means to release a person from all charges, all the penalty, the price, and the punishment of an offense. If forgiveness is the deliberate action to release a person from their guilt. Let's just establish the definition of forgiveness. So now we got the different levels of that forgiveness. Exoneration. Exonerate them. We wipe the slate totally clean as if it has never happened. You know, I've been robbed before. My car windows have been bust out before. I have, when I own my salon, I have had people steal from me at the salon. I've had people um, one time steal our whole money bag for the week. Okay. <laughs> 
you know, growing up until I got in the last house I was in, I always took people in my home. I was taking in over 20, used to be 23, probably about 25, 26 family, families over my life. But you really learn some things when you're dealing with that kind of level of taking people in and dealing with the issues that people have. And you find out that everybody truly is different. And sometimes I figured out that people cannot hurt you unless they have access to your heart. Somebody you don't care nothing about, they don't have the ability to hurt you in a certain way. They might disappoint you, they might let you down, but be able to bring you pain and hurt. No, you gotta have some kind of level of expectation for the individual. and if. if in order for them to even be able to inflict any type of pain. But anyway, exonerate means to free from all guilt, all charges, all punishment, all penalties, as if the event never happened. It means to wipe the slate clean. That's what Jesus does for us when we repent of our sin. And repent is not just saying, I'm sorry. Repent means to turn. It means to change your mind. It means that you change your action. One direction, one definition say it is a change of direction. So it means I was headed this way. I realized I was headed in the wrong direction and I make a turn. You know, so to repent means to turn. It means to move in a different direction. So when we release repentance unto God, then God forgives us then God absolutely, and he exonerates us. He frees us from the penalty, the price of sin, and the price of sin. He frees us from that, thank God for Jesus. So exoneration, exoneration. When you are exonerated, the person no longer is um, held at fault. It is no longer held at fault when a person is exonerated. I'm reading from my notes. Uh, it means the slate is wiped clean and that relationship is fully restored to its previous sense of innocence. When I was talking about the devil with Eve, that's what he took, y'all. He took her innocence. She was innocent. She thought the world was a perfect place. She didn't know it was a devil out there that could deceive her and that would deceive her. It stripped her of her innocence because she could never go back to that place of who she was before. She could never look at things the same. Again, everything now had to be filtered in. You know, she had to judge everything differently now because of um, the deception that had took place in her life. So when we think of the word exoneration, it, it, it essentially means to forgive and forget. You know, parents are good at exoneration. <laughs> Your children can do some, ooh, Lord. Cuss at your show out, slam doors. Here you are taking care of them, struggling, doing the best you can to put a roof over their head and they acting crazy on you. But you know what? When that child starts to do better, you are your heart is overjoyed. Your heart is leaping for joy. You're excited about it. That relationship is often restored back to the place previous of the offense. They've been totally exonerated. You don't think about it anymore. You don't throw it in their face anymore. It don't even come up anymore. You're so proud of where they are now. That's all you can think about. That's all that your memories are built on. Not talking about the thrill for me when they were three months when they was a baby, okay? Or even the things when children sometimes go astray when they're in their teens and things like that. But when they grow up and become a responsible member of society, we are absolutely ecstatic. We forget about all of those things that happened in those teen years and all we can talk about and brag about to our friends is look at what my baby done. They done something with their life. They done something with their career. They're a great father. They're a great mother. We're so excited. We have exonerated them. We have thrown it in the sea of forgetfulness. And sometimes we don't even remember the issues unless, you know, it, it, the conversation comes up. You're like, whoa, I forgot about that. Oh, my God. Forgot how they used to steal my car. Forgot how they used to steal my money. Forgot how they used to get mad and punch holes in the walls. Forgot how they used to cuss me out like a dog, like I ain't give birth to them. I forgot all about about it because it's been you've been so far removed from who that person was so that's two things that has happened in that place and the main thing is that the person action absolutely changed so it allowed you their actions begin to erase the memories of their past 
their actions. It became, they start to give you new proof. Come on, they start. I had somebody say to me um, that I hurt their feelings because they came to my house and I, I asked somebody to walk with them uh, because they had not been a very trustworthy person before. So they called me the next day and they said I really hurt their feelings that, um, um, yeah, that I had people watching them. I said, you know what? It hurt my feelings that I got to have people to watch it. Okay, let's talk about them kind of hurt feelings. If you want people to trust you, you must be trustworthy. But until you've proven that, oh, well, I've changed. Well, that's good. The same way you proved to me that I could not trust you, you're going to have to prove to me that I can. And guess what? It ain't coming by your word of mouth. Because we have been down that road before. <laughs> okay. It's coming by actions. It's coming by absolute actions. And until those actions are proven, guess what? There's some stipulations that's going to be in place. So that brings us to our next one, which is called forbearance. Forbearance is, says that, okay, I understand that you have committed a crime against me and I want to trust you. Uh, the person may sincerely apologize. They may um, make certain types of strides to correct the situation, but because of what has taken place and that they may have a track record of how they they have been, then you have to uh, walk circumspectly with that person and allow them the space to either uh, be shifted into exoneration or the, the third one that we're going to get to. So, uh, yeah, forbearance means that you're for, you forbear with that person. Let's say you tell somebody something in confidence. Everything I say to people, I expect for it to be in confidence because if I wanted a million friends, I would have them. If I wanted a million people to know what I tell you, guess what? I tell them myself. So when I tell you something, because we're an adult and we are responsible people, I expect what I tell you not to be blessed in the newspaper because I should have to, I should be able to have that type of confidence in the person that I'm speaking to. But let's say you're not raised that way, that if somebody don't tell you specifically, don't tell nobody what I told you, then you're going to tell it. Let's just say you told that way. But let's say somebody told you something in confidence and they said, hold, hold this for me, or you, or you told somebody that. And the next thing you know, you hear it. Um, from one of your other family members. Well, such and such told me about this and that. And then you go back to the person and say, I thought I asked you to keep that in confidence. And they say, oh, well, it was just our family. You know, I got a right to tell them that don't, you know, or that was your best friend. I thought you didn't mind me telling her. It might take a little bit of time. You might forbear. You might say, you know what? I forgive them, but I can't release the same level of trust to that person. Now when I tell you something, I realize that I may have to limit, you know, the depth of what I am willing to share with you, that I can't tell you something that I don't want somebody else to know because I know that it's not safe with you. So I might can only share with that person things that I don't mind somebody else knowing. Okay, I went to Walmart, okay, so whatever, you know, you got to uh, censor your information, you have to censor the things that you share because they have uh, violated your trust and it has to be built, it has to be rebuilt or you have to see if that's just the nature of that person and then you have to set the proper boundaries in place, that's forbearance, it's saying, hey, forgive you for what you've done, but you can't be restored back to previous condition. So y'all follow me. Exoneration, slate is wiped clean. Restore it back to uh, fellowship, relationship. It's as if it never happened. You restore it back to previous condition. I've been robbed by people and we back at previous condition, almost. You know, so it's, you got to be able to forgive so you can live, but it does not mean that you have to allow people to have the same level of access to your life. Okay? So we got um, exoneration, we got forbearance, and then the last one uh, is called release. Release. And y'all, you might not like this, but everybody is required to release. Everybody is required to release people from their heart, release them from the hatred, 
Release them from the pain. You are required by God. Every believer is required by God to forgive in that first level of forgiveness. The other two are not requirements. They will only depend on the situation itself and the wisdom of God that you need to apply to the situation. But every last one of us are required by God to release people from our heart, release them from the incident. In other words, to be able to let that thing go. To let that thing go. The thing about release is that it is often considered the lowest level of um, forgiveness. Now, some people use release for situations that they never got apologies to. But I, I don't just limit release to that because there are people I forbear with. There are people that I've absolutely exonerated that have never given me an apology. And it's okay. Because <laughs> sometimes people... Uh, are sorry and they are regretful in their heart, but they just never express it, you know, but their actions may prove over time that they can be trusted again. So, but, um, but a lot of people keep people in this release level if they've never received a official apology or the person has never made any strides to correct the situation, but sometimes that's not necessarily even grounds for this um this level but re what release allows you to do is quit defining your life by the hurt that was done to you you release them from it you say you know what whether they ever sorry for it or not i'm gonna let it go on my behalf <laughs> Whether they ever apologize to me or not, whether they ever sorry for the abuse they caused me, whether they ever sorry for molesting me, whether they ever sorry for, for abusing my children, whether they were ever sorry for stealing the money out of my bank account, whether they were ever sorry for spreading gossip and rumors and lies about me. No, we, they might not be exonerated. Nope. Slate might not be wiped absolutely clean. It might not be thrown in the sea of forgetfulness, but there is no hatred in my heart towards that person. I release them and I let them go. Relationship may not ever be restored. You might not ever, and y'all ain't gonna like this. Y'all church folk ain't gonna like this, but I want you to study the word out. You might not ever like them again. Y'all don't like that kind of preaching. Y'all don't like it. You don't like it. Study the word out. Study. I challenge you, people of God. Study the word out. All relationships were never restored. All relationships were never came back into right alignment. If that's the case, then what you going to tell God about the devil? What you going to tell God about the devil? So anyway... Oh, um, release means that you let it go. You let it go. You let the grip of it. You let the impact of it. You let the pain of it. You let it go. And you free yourself from the bondage of it. You free yourself from thinking about them and being consumed about them all day long and want to see revenge come upon them. You let them go. Forgiveness is required from all believers, people of God, from every single one of us. We must forgive our offenders. We must forgive our betrayers. We must forgive those who have wronged us. We must forgive those that have abused us. We must forgive those that have let, let us down. We must forgive them. And there are people out here today that are angry with God. Come on. They are mad at God because they feel like God didn't work some things out. you got to let those things go out of your heart so that you can be free to live your life and free from the bondage of that pain. Because pain will keep you in bondage. Pain will keep you in a place where you see through the lenses of pain. You hear you hear through the ears of pain. You serve through a heart of pain. Come on. And so everything is filtered by what you've been through. You have to. All believers are required to release their offenders. To release them. To release them. To let them go. Some of them will have to pay restitution. Some of them will have to do time in jail. <laughs> Some of them will be exonerated. Okay. But so let's be sensitive to the spirit of Almighty God, okay? Let's be sensitive in how we counsel people or not counsel people, especially when we don't have the divine revelation of 
uh, uh, the, the uh, I, I'm finna make up a word probably, criticality of the situation, the severity of the situation. So I just encourage you today, y'all, no matter what has been done to you, what offense has taken place, that you release those people from your heart, that you free yourself from the bondage and enslavement of their thoughts and their actions and being consumed by the life they tried to sentence you to. I want you to exonerate yourself from the grip of hatred, the grip of fear, the grip of regret in the name of Jesus. I love you to life. And when you let go of that hatred, when you let go of that unforgiveness, when you let go of that bitterness, because you got to realize that all those emotions are taking up room in your house. They're taking up room in your heart. When you allow God to mend your heart and you let those things go, then you make room for what God has for you. You make room for more love, more peace, more joy, more relationships that are going to be lasting and going to be fruitful and that's going to prosper. All right, people of God, I've enjoyed my time with you today. I love you with the love of Almighty God. May you go in the grace and the peace of God. Come on, that surpasses all understanding. All right, y'all be blessed, and I'll see you next week.